Okay, um, let's uh, move ahead. Um, okay, so uh, these are the notebooks that we're going to be going through today. Um, and uh, this, uh, we're going to start with this NumPy notebook, um, which you can open and take a look at. Um, but, oh boy, let's uh, see if we can hide some of this stuff. Um, so this has a lot of like text and examples and, and stuff, and we're going to be working through all this, but I actually, so I just wanted to point it out because it's there for reference, but what I actually want you to do is um, go back to uh, the list of your notebooks and click here, this new drop down, and choose, uh, you probably will only see Python 3. Um, I have a whole bunch of different um, options I can choose, but uh, create a new Python 3 notebook. And that'll bring up something that looks like this. I'm going to go ahead and hide my um, toolbars again because they're in the way. OK. SciPy, and then so you see into that one, and then into the scientific Python for that directory, oh, you should see the new stuff. Why does this keep taking forever to do this? Um, I don't, I don't press control C again. Yeah, I think it. Yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure why. Oh, you have it too So, okay, so once you have this notebook up, um, now we're in the same environment that we had yesterday. Um, and uh, so if you recall from yesterday, the way that we um, start using a Python library, such as NumPy, is we use this import statement. So I want you to go ahead and type the stuff that I'm typing so you can follow along with me. So I'm going to import NumPy as NP. And then you can do shift enter. Um, so we, we talked about this a little bit yesterday. If you do control enter, it will keep you on the same cell. And if you do shift enter, it'll take you to the next cell, which is particularly useful if you're sort of like growing a notebook as you're working on it, because it will automatically insert a new cell at, like beneath the one that you were just working on. So you don't have to like bother inserting a new cell yourself. Um, so once we have NumPy, um, does anyone remember uh, how we created an array in NumPy? Yeah. And what do I put inside here? Uh, so uh, that's a slightly different thing, which we're going to get to in a moment. Um, when you're using NumPy.array like this, um, what you just want to put inside is a list. So actually what I'm going to do is erase this. And I'm going to create a list called odds, which just has some odd numbers in it. And we can like print out what odds looks like, just as 1, 3, 5, 7. And so I can create a odds array by using this numpy.array and passing in the odds list. So the argument that this takes is just a list of numbers. Um, so you, you could either do this, or you could do it like that if you wanted to, too. Either way is fine. And then once you have created that, you should see it printing out like that. And you'll notice that the array looks a little bit different from a list because it has this, these array and parentheses around it when you actually uh, print it out. Let me see. I'm going to. Is that 
too small? Or is that, is that okay still? Okay, because I, I want a little bit more vertical screen real estate. Um, see if I can do, yeah, there we go. It's a little bit better too, okay. Okay, so, and then arrays are, act a lot like lists in a lot of ways. Um, so lists you can index into, like I can take a look at odds one. This is a one dimensional array, right? That's this is a one dimensional array, that's right. It just has, and it just has one element right now, right? Uh, the, no, so it has four elements, one, three, five, and seven, or at least mine does, based on the way I created I, it. I thought the list, it was like list is the, is the first element. Uh, so, oh, okay. So yeah. So you can have. Um, so if I did this, for example, um, where I'm I'm making a list that has odds in it, and then turning that into an array, that would give me a an array that has like. It's a two-dimensional array where one of the dimensions has one element and the other dimension has four elements. Um, but in the way that we had it just before without those brackets, this is just one dimension and it has four elements in it. And you can get the dimensionality of an array by um, looking at the shape. So if I do odds are dot shape, this will tell me um, both how many dimensions it has and how many elements are in each dimension. So if I run this, you'll see that it says, so you remember uh, what this is called with the parentheses? It's called a tuple. It's like a list, but not exactly. We, we talked about them a little bit yesterday. Um, and so for tuples that have only one element, they have this kind of funny thing where it's just like the number and then a comma. Um, but so this is a tuple with one element, um, and that's four. So it means that there's one dimension and there's four elements in that dimension. So if I if I did this thing where earlier I had odds with the um, brackets, and I run that, now if I run the shape thing, does anyone want to guess what the shape is going to be? One comma four, I think I heard. And that's correct, um, because what it is is that we've we've put this list inside another list, and now the outer list has only one element, which is the inner list, and the inner list has four elements. So now we get one comma four. Um, yeah. It's kind of like nested lists. That's a useful way to think about it. I think for when you're dealing with two-dimensional arrays, you can actually have arrays that have as many dimensions as you want. So for like you know, a 10-dimensional array. I think it's a little bit less useful to think of it as nested lists, but definitely for two-dimensional arrays, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to it being just a one-dimensional array for now, though. Um, we'll, we'll get back to some two-dimensional arrays in a little bit. So, um, just like lists with arrays, we can um, index, so if we wanted to get the first element of this, or the second element, because it's zero indexed, so zero, one is the second element, um, and then this would give us three, because that's the second element of this array. Um, and we can also do slicing. Um, if I am moving stuff off the screen too quickly, please let me know, because um, I know that there's not like a lot of space there, unfortunately. Um, so we can do one to three, and if I do that, this is what uh, this is what the array is. So if I do one to three, what am I going to get using this slice syntax? Remember, this selects like a range of numbers. Three, five, seven. Right. Um, or uh, yeah, sorry. Um, it doesn't have seven in it, and this is this is a really like easy mistake to make. I just made it myself. Um, uh, is that the the numbers are? It's inclusive for the lower number and exclusive for the higher number, meaning that it it will include uh, index one and it'll include index two, but index three, which is the last one you've specified, it doesn't actually include that one. So we don't get seven. If we wanted to include seven, we would need it to be 
uh, sorry, one, one to four, and then that would give us three, five, and seven. Um, okay, and um, so, and then a similar thing to the shape, um, and this is something you can do for lists too, is you can use this len function, and that will tell us what the length of the array is, um, which in this case is just four. Um, so uh, here's a, a, a question. If, if we were working with that array that we just had where it had dimensionality one comma four, um, and we used len on it, what do you think len would return? One. Right, because it is basically, this is kind of the case where it's useful to think of it as a nested list of lists, because you have this outer list which has one element in it, so when you do len on the array, even though it's a two-dimensional array and it has like four things in it total, the outer dimension only has one, one thing in it. So that's a, um, think, getting used to thinking about the shapes of arrays is, it can be kind of tricky if you haven't done a lot of that before, um, but uh, it, it makes doing stuff with arrays pretty powerful later on. So, okay, so another thing um, that we uh, looked at yesterday was the fact that you can do operations with NumPy arrays like really easily. So if we wanted to add, let's say I wanted to create an array of even numbers that is just every even number after these odd numbers that I have, uh, how would I do that? Does anybody remember how we would do that? What, what do you want to obtain here? So I, um, I want to obtain an array that looks like uh, two, four, six, eight. And I, I'm going to call it even R. You could do it with a for loop. Um, you can also do a scalar addition and add one to it. And those are both valid ways of doing it, um, but I think it's a little bit easier to do it with the scalar addition. So let me, I'm going to actually write out both ways of doing it just for comparison. So um, we could start with, let's start with even, where this is just a list, and then we could write a for loop. So for odd number in odd, uh, odds array, we could do even dot append odd number plus one, and then I would have a uh, list called even, which gives me two, four, six, eight. Um, and this is using that, that for loop syntax that we worked on yesterday. So it's pulling out every odd number in that array and then adding one to it and appending it to the even list. Um, and, but the way that you would do this using scalar addition would be just odds r plus one. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna say, give me this one and apply it to every element in the array. And um, it does, you don't have to tell it to actually loop over the array, that's just sort of like what NumPy does by default. And so we get 2468 out from that. Um, and this is like a really, this is one of the most powerful things about NumPy is it just makes doing these types of operations so easy. Um, is, you know, when you need to transform, you know, like a large group of numbers, all you have to do is, you know, add one to it. You don't have to write a whole lot of code to, to get that out. When you define even at the top, mm -hmm. right, with the brackets, yes. it looks like it's a list, right? Yeah, so this actually is a list, yeah. That's a good point. Um, if I wanted to turn this into array, an array, I could do like that. Thank you. Yeah. And there's actually another way, way to do it, and we'll get to that in just a moment. So, yeah. Okay, yep. Uh, here, you mean? Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, these two cells are essentially equivalent. Um, so basically under the scenes when NumPy, so odds array is a NumPy array, and when you do this addition, Python is like, okay, NumPy array, here's a one, like, do addition with it. And NumPy interprets that command to do addition as adding one to every element in the array. So it's doing yeah, there's basically like a for loop implicitly in this line. It's just you're not doing it. Um, and it's actually, uh, if you're ever writing 
code that is more performance sensitive. Um, this is uh, going to be a faster way to do it because NumPy is actually written in Fortran and C um, and compiled, and it's done in a way that's really highly optimized. And you know, people have spent a lot of time making that code really, really fast. Um, and so this is going to be faster than doing it um, with a for loop in Python. But for the most part, you don't need to worry too much about that. Yeah. That's right. Right, so here I created a list first, and then I added numbers to that list, right. and then I converted it to an array. So we just lose memory, or, or we lost something? I mean, I, I, I don't know. No, it doesn't lose anything. It just, um, it, what this line is doing here is it's basically saying, um, I want to recreate the variable called even. Um, using a variable that already exists called even. It's a, yeah, it's a little bit like weird um, to see this kind of thing um, when, when you're not used to seeing variables being redefined using their original value. But basically, you can think of it as like, this is like the original value of even. And then we're using, like it's taking that and putting it to the side. And then it's saying, OK, create me a variable called even and use this thing over here that you like set off to the side. Um, and so it ends up overriding itself, um, but it, it works fine, so yeah. Okay, so um, along the lines of the scalar addition, there's other things that you can do with arrays like uh, element-wise addition or multiplication using the arrays themselves. So if I have even r plus odds r, um, what do you think that's going to give me? No one wants to venture a guess? It will add each element of even r mm -hmm. to the uh, appropriate element of odds. R. Yes, that, that's exactly right. So um, here's actually a case where it's like useful to use shape. So I'm going to let me I'm going to remove this for a second. So if we do even r dot shape and I'm going to I'm going to print this out and print odd r dot shape. Oh, it's odds r. There we go. Um, these two have the same shape. So that means that you can basically like lie them on top of each other and say like for each element that lies you know, each of the elements that are like next to each other do this operation. Um, so when we do even r plus odd r, what we get, odds r, keeps tripping me up. Um, you end up getting uh, two plus one, and then three plus four, five plus six, and seven plus eight. Um, and that gives you this array. What do you think would happen if we tried to do this with two arrays that didn't have the same shape? Error. Yeah, it would give an error. It would say something like the dimensions of these arrays don't match. Um, so I, I really I use this this shape attribute of NumPy arrays all the time when I'm working with them because it's sometimes hard to remember like especially if you have a lot of NumPy arrays like which ones have which shape and are they the same shape and am I like you know, is it going to be okay for me to add things together or whatever? And so, you know, if, if you're ever getting errors about things not having the same shape, check the shape of your arrays, make sure that it matches what you think the shapes are supposed to be. Um, and if they're not the same, uh, then you can go back and investigate your earlier code to figure out why that is the case. Okay, so um, earlier when we created this, this even array um, or this even list, I'm going to actually comment out this line here um, and rerun this cell so that we, we get a list back out. So evens is a list. Um, here, to create this list, we used this append function. But you can't do that with NumPy. So if I come down here and I try to do even r dot append, let's say 10, that's going to give me an error. And it says, attribute error numpy dot nd array object has no attribute append, meaning there, the, the there's no function that you can use here. Um, and that's because once you create a NumPy array, it's fixed. It's like you have to specify the size of that array before you do stuff with it. So 
Um, that either means that you can create a list ahead of time and then convert it to a NumPy array, like we did before, or you can construct an em empty NumPy array first and then put stuff in it that you want. So I said there was a, a different way of creating that evens array that, that we did earlier. Um, and I'm going to show you how to do that by using this method of sort of pre-allocating an array first. So um, we know uh, that we are going to want it to be the same size as the odds array. So I could do even r equals, um, and I'm going to use this special function called mp.zeros. Um, so someone over here earlier said, when I asked about the NumPy array, like, what do you give it? Um, and they said the length of the array. Um, and so you don't do that with NumPy.array, but you can do that with NumPy.zeros. And so here, what we can do is length of uh, odds array. And does anyone want to guess what this is going to give me? Right, an array of four zeros. Um, NumPy also has a, a similar function called ones that does the same thing, except it gives you an array of ones rather than an array of zeros. Um, so if I do this, now even R doesn't actually have the stuff that I want in it, it's just zeros. But I could write a for loop. Um, I'm going to do this in the same cell here. So for. Um, so I'm going to use another function, which I don't think you've seen before yet. Um, it's called range. And or you might have seen it briefly yesterday. But range will give you a list of numbers um, that you ask for. So if I do uh, range len odds r, that's going to give me a, number, a list of numbers from 0 to whatever the length of odds r is. And I'm looping over those. So on each iteration of the loop, I'm going to first get 0, then 1, then 2, and then 3. And then it'll stop because it has four elements. And what I can do is use this indexing syntax to assign a value to even r, where I pull out the corresponding value from odds r and add 1. And now if I run this, we get the same thing, 2, 4, 6, 8. So this is a way. Of, this is another way of creating a NumPy array um, without uh, creating a list and then converting it to a NumPy array. So it, it still would be better probably to do just odds r plus one in this case. But if you're doing more complex computations where maybe you can't just do like a plus one, you might want to write a loop like this where you first initialize your array to something that's just empty, and then you loop over every element of that array um, and fill, basically a fill in the array as you go. Does anyone have questions about that? OK. Um, so there's one um, sort of gotcha about um, creating an arrays with like numpy.zeros and numpy.1s. Um, and that's if you are trying to create a multi-dimensional array. So a really common um, like mistake to make that I make myself all the time is I'll try to create an array. So let's say I wanted like an array that was like six by eight. So, so it has like six rows and eight columns. Um, if I write this code to create an, uh, an array of zeros that has six rows and eight columns, it actually gives me an error. Um, and the error actually isn't all that useful. Um, it says data type not understood. Uh, and the reason for why you get this error is because it's actually interpreting this second um, number here, not as like the size of the second dimension, but as uh, the data type that you're passing to the array. So if you remember yesterday, we said we could specify like d type equals float or d type equals int. It's interpreting this 8 as the data type. And it's like, I don't know what 8 is. Um, that's not a data type that I know. And, and so it throws an error. Um, so does anyone want to guess what you have to do to make this not throw an error so that it does create a, an array of actually 6 by 8? 
Uh, actually, either a list or a tuple will work, yeah. So um, usually people use tuples, but it doesn't matter. Um, you can use either. So if I do this and run it, now I have my array of six by eight zeros. Um, and, and then, of course, if you wanted to create an even higher dimensional array, you can just keep adding numbers. So I could do you know, three or four, seven, one, two. And as you get like higher and higher dimensions, like, I mean, it's like not very useful to look at this because it's, it's just so big. But um, NumPy lets you do that. And sometimes you do need to do that. So OK, questions? OK. Is this Usually, how you allocate array. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so here's kind of a note about like depending on what you're going to be using this stuff for, is if you're doing something like data analysis, you probably won't actually use like NumPy dot zeros and and stuff very much. Um, the reason for that is because you'll probably be using some slightly different tools, which Matt is going to talk about um, very shortly. Um, but if you're doing something like uh, writing uh, code for some type of mathematical model or you're running simulations, um, doing that kind of scientific computing, um, it's likely that you're going to need to like allocate an array, do some computations, fill in the data for that array, and then save it. So it sort of depends on what your use case is, whether or not um, you're going to end up using this type of thing very much. Uh, here, yeah. So, um, so when we uh, use this bracketing syntax, it basically means pull out the element at that location. So I here is this variable that's defined by the for loop. So on the first iteration of the for loop, I is going to be zero because we have this range from zero to four. Um, and so on the first iteration, this is basically going to be um, even r zero equals odds r zero. Actually, let me. Um, I'm going to create a new cell here, briefly. So, so. Why aren't I using brackets instead of? Uh, so parentheses are only for when you're calling a function. Um, brackets are when you want to get an element out of a list or an array, um, and that's a slightly different thing from calling a function. So, um, it yeah, it can get a little confusing um, with the, the difference between that, but uh, it, yeah, I, I guess you can kind of think of it as like if you want to like do a computation, then you're probably calling a function. If you're just trying to like access a value or store a value, then you're probably doing indexing and you want to use the, the square brackets. That's not like 100% true, but it's probably a good rule of thumb. Um, so yeah. OK. Um, I'm going to move this then. OK. So. Um, OK, so that's kind of like how you create arrays and, and work with their shapes and, and stuff a bit. Um, we can also, though, uh, use arrays. If, so a lot of times you might have data that you want to load or data that you want to save out. Yesterday, we saw loading data using this numpy.loadtxt function. Um, there's another way in which you can load data, which is actually um, numpy has its own data format. Um, and so you'll sometimes see files that end with npz or mpy, and those are uh, NumPy data files. So if I come back here to my notebook list, if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see that there's a few CSV files here, and then there's also this npz file. So if you ever see an npz file, you know that it's a NumPy file. Um, and the way that we load NumPy files, going back to this, um, uh, this notebook is like this. So you use this mp.load function. And then you type the name of the file that you want. And this actually um, gives you a special thing called a NumPy like data store. 
and it acts a little bit like a dictionary. So uh, if I want to um, look at what things are in that data store, I can use this keys method. So when I run this cell, it's going to show me that there's two things in this file. One is called years and one is called precip. Um, and so what I can do is pull those out. So I'm going to create one variable called years where I do store years. And like I said, it acts a lot like a dictionary. Um, so we can access the elements just like a dictionary. Oh, sorry, yes. Um, let me, I'm going to split this up into two cells. So there's store.keys and then actually accessing. And um, the reason why you need to use this dot keys is because if you um, just do store, it, it'll say, this is an MPZ file which isn't actually all that useful because it doesn't tell you anything about what's in the file. Um, but if you use this keys uh, function, then, then it works. Okay. Um, and so um, another really powerful thing that we can do with NumPy is we can do all sorts of computations like across these arrays. So I think we saw the sum function yesterday. Um, and we can do something similar like with the mean function. So I have this precip array, which is, uh, looks like it's a two-dimensional array. Uh, no, it's a one-dimensional array, but NumPy sometimes prints it out in a way that makes it easier to read. We can tell for sure by looking at the shape. And it's a one-dimensional array with 28 elements. So if I do precip.mean, what this is going to do is it's going to take the mean of all of these elements and just give me back a single number. Um, so the mean of the precip array is 27.83. Um, and notice that this is a, a function that we're calling on the NumPy array itself. Um, there's other NumPy functions that we can call that we start by using NP. So for example, np.array, np.1s, np.0s, those were all things that we accessed through NP rather than through the array itself. Another thing, for example, that we would access through NP is log. And so this is going to give us the natural logarithm. Um, and a lot of these NumPy functions, again, they act on all of the elements. So when I do np.log, it's going to give me the natural log of every element of the precip array. Um, so just as like a short exercise, uh, I want you to take a look at um, if you do precip dot and then press tab, you'll see all of the things that you, all the functions you can call from on the NumPy array. And if you do np dot and then tab, you'll see a different list of things. And so I just want you to take, you know, just one minute to take a look at what these are and compare them and see if you can find any like differences or similarities between what you can do on the NumPy array itself versus what you can do from the high level NumPy module. Um, and talk to the person that you're sitting next to about this. I, I miss something here. I can. Scroll back up to where, sorry? The empty here? Uh, oh, oh, the empty log. OK, yes. Mm -hmm. See if you can find one function that exists both with the precip and with np and a function functions that don't that either exist only in precip or only in np how do you find out what a function does good question so if i do tab and i find let's say um, dot i can do the question mark afterwards and then uh, if i do shift enter it'll pull up this little window with documentation on the function mm -hmm. thanks sure. OK, who, who has found a function that is the same or that exists for both the uh, array and the NumPy um, module? Max, min, min. Yeah. Max, min, yep. Um, some other ones are sum, prod, um, uh, mean, 
in general, in general, it seems like there's functions that uh, exist for both of them are ones that like operate on an array and give you back an array, either an array or a, a scalar. So, um, but of it, but it by transforming the array in some way. So like um, log isn't something that you can do, I think. Yeah. So that doesn't work. You have to do mp.log. And that, but that works. Um, I, I don't think that there's exactly like a hard and fast rule as to like why some functions exist at the top level NumPy and some of them exist on the arrays themselves. My kind of like general feeling is like things like np.log are, they are, they're just sort of like a, a filter that you're passing the array through. So you're like, just like do a log on every element and then, then that's it. But it's not like, it's not transforming the array itself. Whereas something like mean is actually like taking the elements and compressing them down into something. And so the things that are like transforming the array into a different type of array are ones that are often like you can do on the array itself. And other ones like log tend to be ones that you have to do from the NumPy module. Um, but so, you know, this can make it a little bit confusing. If you see a function that has the same name, it's gonna be basically the same function. Um, but if you're looking for, you know, can I do X in NumPy, you should probably check both this high level NumPy module and um, that uh, functions that you can call directly on the array itself. Um, okay, so um, uh, we have uh, one more thing that we're gonna do before we switch over to pandas, um, which we, we actually saw a little bit yesterday already, which is Boolean indexing. So um, I'm gonna create a new variable called average, and I'm gonna set it equal to the mean of this precip array. Um, and as we saw before, it's equal to like 27 point whatever. Um, and if I do that, does anyone remember what that type of thing is gonna do? Right, it'll give me back a Boolean array, and it'll be the same size as precip, and it'll be true in all the places where it's greater than average, and false for all the places where it's less than average. Um, and if we run it, we in fact see that that's the case. And um, so we can set this to a variable, let's call it above. Let me print it out again. And now, if I did, that, does anyone remember what that does? Um, does it just pull out the elements that, where that's true? Yep, yeah, that's right. So this is, it's called a mask, and it is basically a really easy way to pull out things that match a particular condition that you want. So, like this is a really common type of, um, I guess, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's a pattern. It's a really common pattern to say, I want to only select the elements for which something is true. And so you create a mask array that compute, computes that condition for each element of the array. And then you index back into the original array using that mask. Um, and that gives you back a new array that only includes the ones that are greater than average. And so if we take a look at, so average is 27.8. We can verify that these are actually all, in fact, greater than average. So could you use that same mask to go into the years and have the corresponding years? Yes. That have those? Yeah, exactly. So, um, so the question was, uh, so we also have this years array, if you remember. We haven't really done anything with it yet. But if I do, if I print years.shape and I print precip.shape, so this is, these two arrays correspond to um, precipitation and the year that that precipitation was recorded. Um, and so they therefore have the same shape. And so if I use this mask, this above mask, in years, <laughs> um, if I use the above mask in years, just like I did with precip, it's gonna give me 
the years for which precipitation was above average. Um, and that is 1993, 95, 96, 97, 98, 2000, 2003, 2005, 2006, 2010, and 2011, apparently. Yes? Um, for when you run this? Yeah. Um, hmm. That's interesting. I don't, I think like different versions of NumPy might handle it slightly differently. Does any, do any of the other instructors know? The question was, well, yeah. So if you're seeing like a slightly different output with like different data types, it's probably okay. It probably just means that, um, you might have a slightly different version of NumPy or something like that. Um, but um, th so this type of thing, though, is really, really useful. So you know, if uh, you know, I find I am constantly needing to compute things like you know, do this computation, but only for cases in which you know I have for which like my data is greater than something, and so you create a mask. And you only you pull out the data that corresponds to where it matches, and um, then uh, this just makes it very fast and easy to do that, as opposed to having to write a lot of loops in which so you could write a loop in which you do like for each element of a precip if that element is greater than average, then print out the year, but that's a lot of code to write, um, and in this case we can just do it in a couple lines. Um, so another uh, thing that you might want to do is to select the opposite elements. I don't know if we talked about this yesterday, but the way to invert um, a NumPy array, a Boolean NumPy array, um, is, is it has this like kind of a funny syntax. You do this tilde character, and then you type the name of the array. So it almost looks like a negative sign, but it's a tilde, and you can read it as not. Um, and so that will give me, it'll flip the trues and the falses so that it's the opposite. Um, and so if we wanted to, for example, get the years in which it was below the average, we would do years, not above. And that would give me a different set of years. So, so is there a way to get element, get the element number associated with the um, years above? Yes, that's a great question. So. The way that you would do this is still using this Boolean array. Um, and it uses a, a function called, it's called np.argware is, <coughs> is the function name. And if you pass np.argware um, an array, uh, a Boolean array, like above, and you run it, it will, it will give you back um, something that has the indices of the years, or uh, of the places where above is true. And so it's true on the sixth element, or the seventh, the ninth, the tenth, and so on and so forth. There's a similar function called non-zero, which basically does the same thing. Um, yes? So on those elements, um, how does, if the arrays are 8 by 6 or 6 by 8, how does it, how does it number the elements to go left to right? Uh, good question. So um, in the case of one-dimensional arrays, um, it just yeah. Yeah, goes left to right. In two-dimensional arrays, um, so let's see. I'm going to let me create, I'm going to create some random data really quickly. to. So here's a, a, another thing you can do. Um, I think we saw this yesterday where you can create uh, some random numbers. So let's say we had six by eight. Um, so I have some random numbers between zero and one. And let's say I'm interested in, um, places where these numbers are greater than 0 0.5. So if I take a look at that array, this is also a 2D array, but it's Boolean. And now if I ran non-zero on this array, what it's going to give me is 
a tuple of arrays where the first element of the tuple, or the first array, is the index along that first dimension. And the second uh, element in that tuple, the second array, is the index along the second dimension. So what this would mean is that the element at 0, 1 is greater than half. So if we go back here to random r, 0, 1, so t taking a look at the corresponding elements, see that that is, in fact, bigger than 1. The next one is 0, 3. Um, next one is 0, 4. Or, sorry, 0, 5, and so on and so forth. Does that answer your question? Does that make sense? It's a little bit like, um, yeah, you have to, it, it will, won't just give you the, um, it won't just use like a single ordering of numbers. Um, it will try to give you the numbers for each of the dimensions that you have. And, and if we try to pull out um, greater than half like this, there's a problem now, right? Because like this is a two-dimensional array, but we don't have the same number of elements in the columns and rows that are greater than half. So what NumPy is going to do is it's going to give us back just a flat array. So it'll take out all of those elements that are greater than half and give me back just a single dimensional array that includes those elements. So even though we had a 2D array before, now we only have a 1D array. So something to be aware of. So er everything you're doing is making it where I, I want to go back from, from the array now back to the list so I can use a for loop. Yeah, you can do that. Um, it, it's kind of a, I think if, if a for loop is like an easier way to think about it, then that's the way you should do it. Most of the time you don't do that. Um, I don't usually use for loops, um, but it's partially because learning how to think in like this, like think about working with arrays in this way, it's kind of, it just kind of takes a different way of thinking about it and it takes practice. Um, and it I, might be good to think this way because yeah. this is the way you need to do to mask things and use vectorized machines. Yeah. So. And there's some things that are going to be really um, like kind of nasty to do with loops. So you might have like a, th let's say you had a three dimensional array mm -hmm. and you wanted to just um, take all of the uh, numbers that were less than zero and set them to zero. Um, and if you did that with a loop, you'd have to have three for loops and then an if statement. And it would look really, it would be actually pretty hard to read because you have these three for loops and then an if statement, and so your code is really long. Um, whereas with a NumPy array, it doesn't matter that it's three dimensions. What you could do would be, so the analog here, let's say all the elements that are greater than half, we wanted to set to one. All we have to do is that. And now, when I run this, it's going to modify the values in random array so that if they're greater than 0.5, they become 1. And now we have 1s there. So to I can sort of um, consolidate this code a little bit. Let me copy this. So. And I'll do, I'll make this like a big array. Um, so this has five dimensions now. Um, but still, it still takes me the same number of lines of code. Whereas if you were doing it with for loops, you would have to add a new for loop for every dimension. And here the dim dimensions don't matter. So this is like a case where NumPy is really strong. But if, you're, if all you're doing is working with one or two dimensional arrays, then, and you find it easier to work with for loops, that's I would encourage you to do what is easiest for you because, you know, all of this stuff just takes practice and it's better to do something that's a little bit easier and get in the habit of doing that and get the practice and then eventually you can move on to other stuff later than to try to, like, do stuff that is too hard and then, you know, you don't want to get frustrated when you're doing it. So. Okay. So. Um, uh, before we move on to the next thing, um, I, we're going to do a quick exercise, and we've already started it. So I want you to, um, you can, if you can, copy this code um, in, if you've been following along, um, and then I want you to additionally 
add two lines here that set values that are less than 0.5 to zero. So that when, when we take a look at random R after doing this, we should find that all of the elements are either zero or one. Okay, I think um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, go over the solution to this. So there's actually two ways you could do it. Um, does anyone want to tell me one way in which they did it? Just add one line that's random array and then tilde greater than half equals zero. Great. Yep, that's one way to do it. Um, the other way you could do it would be uh, that would be the other way you could do it. Um, and you could assign this to a different variable if you wanted, um, like less than half. Um, you, you actually, though, want to be careful with doing it like this. Um, if, uh, if uh, depending on what your data is, and if you've already mo done some modifications to the array beforehand, you might get different answers than you actually wanted. So let's say, like, you wanted to, let's say, rather than um, setting this equal to one, we wanted to do, um, Uh, divided by two. Okay, it's a little hard to see, but what I'm doing here is I'm pulling out the values that are greater than half and dividing them by two and then setting them back in the original array um, to be those new divided by two values. And then now if I were to do this random r less than or equal to 0.5, now I have some new values in that array that are less than or equal to 0.5 because I've divided the greater values by two. Um, and so now this would have the effect of actually setting everything to zero, right? Because now everything is less than 0.5. Um, so uh, if you in fact wanted it to be set everything less than 0.5 to zero and divide everything else by two, this would be the way to do it. Um, if you're doing something where the two operations are independent and they don't matter, then, it, then it's fine to do something like this. Just something to be aware of um, when you're doing these types of operations. Okay, so that's kind of um, a little bit more in depth into NumPy than what we saw yesterday. Um, NumPy is, depending on what you're doing, NumPy might become an integral part of your workflow. Um, if you're doing a lot of kind of more like statistics and data analysis, you might find pandas more useful, which is what we're gonna talk about next. Um, if you're doing um, you know, more like numerical computing, the NumPy is really, really powerful. I do it, I use it a lot in my research and it's, um, it makes things easier, it makes things faster, um, and it is really a nice tool to be familiar with and use. And it also underlies a lot of the other tools we're gonna be talking about. So even if you don't end up using it all that much, it's useful to sort of understand just the basics of how it works. Um, that'll help you when you're using other tools like Pandas that we're gonna get into now. So, do you wanna? Take Let's take a five minute break, yeah. Okay. Stand up, stretch, get some snacks. Okay. Start to get back together here. And I just threw this up because it just got posted on Twitter like in the last 10 minutes. Um, but Project Jupiter, which is kind of the umbrella organization for IPython. Um, that we're using has just received six million dollars in grant money to keep developing their project and working on that ecosystem. So, good news for those people. Um, Thomas didn't bring it up, but he's one of the core developers of IPython, um, and but they're all next door doing the IPython tutorial. So, but a lot of those people are here, um, and a lot of them work at either UC Berkeley or Cal Poly. San Luis Obispo. <laughs> Which one are you with? Oh, I'm with NYU. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yay. 
<laughs> so expect good things from that project over the next few years. Uh, so they will be fully staffed, which I'm sure they're all happy about. Okay, so if you've got that NumPy um, notebook open, the, the one you've been working in this whole time, if you click on the name of the notebook up at the top, you can give it a you can give it a descriptive name, like NumPy work or something, and then you can close that tab. We're going to start working in a new notebook here. So once you've closed that uh, that one tab, that notebook, make a new one. So when you're in this view, looking at all of the list of all the files in this directory, go to the new menu and then click on Python 3. And here, right off the bat, we can give it a descriptive name. And then I'm going to hide some of this stuff to get myself some more space. Uh, go to the view menu and, and hit those toggle options again. Okay, so everybody have a new notebook to do their work in. Anyone not have a new notebook to work in? Okay. So, okay, so we're going to get into pandas here. Um, pandas is for, as you're going to see, kind of tabular data. So data you might associate with Excel, data with columns and rows. Um, and so where, where NumPy is very, um, you can put anything in a NumPy array, essentially. It can have any number of dimensions, um, and it can hold any data type, um, as long as it's, well, you it, usually it's the same data type in the array, like they're all be floating point values or all integers or something. Um, where, uh, and by contrast, Pandas has only a, is, is much more limited in the ki kind of data structures it has. Um, it has, as we'll see, like a one-dimensional data structure and a two-dimensional data structure. Um, but it's not something you would use to hold data from an image, for example, like a two-dimensional image. And it's not something you would use um, if you were doing a lot of linear algebra or something. Um, but we are going to see that it is useful in a lot of other situations where you kind of have um, record observation, so you've got a table of data with a bunch of different um, variables across uh, in different columns, and each row represents like one observation. That kind of data is perfect for pandas. So to start off, we'll import pandas as pd, another convention. We've got all these conventions, so we did numpy as np, and um, matplotlib.pyplot as plt. You'll see all of these conventions that we use. So that should go. And uh, so before we get started, let's look at our data. You remember the head function that we used in bash yesterday? We're going to use that on our data preset monthly. I don't know if you caught what I just did here. I, I typed this and I pressed tab. And IPython completed the names of files in this directory for me. So that's how that happened. And then this is an exclamation point. When, when there's an exclamation point at the beginning of the line, that tells IPython, this is a shell command. Run this out at the shell. So this is not a Python command. This is a shell command. Yeah, the layout gets messed up if I go bigger. 
If that's super necessary, I can do it, but I would like to keep more cells on the screen if this, if people can live with this. I don't know. It would be nice if I could get a little more space. Uh, there's a bunch of wasted space over here, but I don't know what to do about it. Can we deal with this or does it really need to be bigger? Sorry. It just is like readable, but takes a little bit of concentration. Okay. Um, for, I'll try to be very explicit about small characters, like exclamations and points and stuff. Um, okay, so if I run this, it looks terrible because my screen is very small right now. Um, but this is the first uh, 10 rows of a CSV file. So this first row is the column names. So we've got region, subregion, station, abbreviation, elevation, month, precip, average precip, percent of average year, and date across there. Um, a little bit of background on where this data came. I scraped this from the California Department of Water Resources website. And it's um, measurements, monthly totals of measurements from real precip state, uh, like rain gauges, all over California. Um, so this is real, actual data running from 1987 to 2014 about rainfall in California. Um, so let's read this in. So I'm going to capture it in a variable called monthly. And we're going to use a function called pd.read. Now, let's just take a minute to appreciate just how many functions there are in pandas that start with read. Um, so we're going to take advantage of this read CSV one. Um, but there's read Excel. There's read clipboard. This is for like if you've just pressed copy in some other page or on, on a website or in some other document, you've just pressed copy, you come over to pandas and you type pd.readclipboard and it reads that data that you have just copied out of your clipboard. Um, there's one for HTML, there's JSON, there's SQL. So if you're working with a, a SQL database and you want to load something straight into pandas by executing a SQL query, read SQL takes um, queries. And then read table is sort of a catch-all for different kinds of tables. So CSV is kind of expecting a well-formatted CSV. Um, with read table, you can be a bit more explicit about like different kinds of delimiters. Maybe you've got a tab delimited file or a space delimited file or something. Read table is, is just a little bit more higher level with fewer assumptions than read CSV. But we can use read CSV. So we'll do pd.readcsv. And then this precip monthly file. So again, I just I was using tab completion there. I uh, just started typing precip underscore m and then hit tab and it finished it for me. Um, I don't know if we showed this feature yesterday. If you're inside of some parentheses like this in IPython and press shift tab, it will pop up this little floating help window showing you the arguments for that function. So pd.readcsv, the first argument is the path of a file. Um, you can specify the separator, defaults to a comma, um, whether there's any compression on it, um, escape characters, quoting characters, etc. like all kinds of options related to like the different formatting of CSV files. We don't need any of them for this file but I wanted to demonstrate this little help feature. I press shift, shift tab. <coughs> and then I'm gonna use, I'm gonna show the first little bit of this using the dot head method. So in the notebook, this prints out like a nicely formatted table. Um, 
Here we've got those same columns from the CSV file. Pandas assumes that the first row of a CSV file is, um, is the column names and automatically reads those. And then the rest of the data here. So region, these are string, 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 string. The elevation is a floating point number. The month is a string. Anyway, you get a quick preview of this. Um, so you know kind of what kind of data you're looking at. Um, we can get how many rows are in there using len. So there's about 62,000 rows, 62,500 rows. Um, look at what it is. It's something called the data frame, um, kind of inspired by R's data frame. Um, and data frame is this core pandas type for a two-dimensional table, something that has column, multiple columns, some rows, and maybe an index. You'll notice over here on the left, with no heading here, the table has this row of integers. Those are an index, and we'll come back to that. That's a useful feature of pandas. Um, yeah. And so we're going to do something here. Uh, we've already got labels for the columns, but we might want labels for the rows. So we can use the set index method to set one of the columns as the index of the table. So we'll see what effect that has. We're going to use station, the station column, which is this column, as the index. And then we'll look at use head again to look at the first couple of rows of that. Actually, this has to go like, we have to grab it, assign it to the variable. So it looks mostly the same, but you'll notice that the station column is gone from the table part, and now it's over here on the left. And we don't have those integers over here anymore. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so now this is the index. And we will use that in just a second here. So that's the high level view of a data frame. Let's start getting things out of it. The primary form of access is uh, sort of like a dictionary. You can grab columns. So that's a lot like a dictionary, but what if we are not sure about what the columns are called? You can look at the monthly.columns, and that's what all the columns are called, their names. Yeah. How, I can go, well, I, how much bigger? Here? Right here? Yeah. Okay. Um, so there are our columns. And to grab one, we use like the dictionary syntax with the brackets and then pass in one of these column names, like precip. And this gives back something a little different. Now, instead of giving back kind of a table, we still see the station which is the index on the left. But now we've only got one set of data values associated with that. So instead of an entire row, we've got one number associated with each row. And this is the amount of precipitation measured at that station in this measurement, uh, which is a month. So this is like rain in inches. Um, and so this is not a data frame. This is called a series, which is pandas' one-dimensional data type, which is a set of labeled data. I didn't have to do anything uh, because back here I did this. I set the index as the station, 
and pandas will always show you the index. So when I ask for just that series, it doesn't give me just the values. It gives me the values and the labels for those values, which are the index. Now what if we want to go a little lower? Let's get, so we'll do monthly precip, and then ask for just one station's worth of data. So say San Jose. So it looks pretty similar, but now we have only the San Jose station and its data. So this is where the index came in. So when I, this gave me a complete column. So we're kind of got a, a couple of hierarchies here. Monthly is a data frame. Monthly precip is one column of that data frame, the complete column. And then San Jose here, now we're indexing just the column by passing in that San Jose label, and so it's giving back every value of the column that's labeled San Jose. So we're kind of doing two levels of indexing. This grabs the column, and this grabs values from that column according to the label. So what if we want to do the other way? What if we want to take the whole table and grab all of the columns for San, or all of the rows for San Jose without getting just the precip data first. Um, for that, we're going to use the special indexer on data frames called dot loc, and this means explicitly, I am indexing rows. I want rows back, and here we're going to do San Jose because the rows are labeled with the station names. So you have to pass in a row label here. And this gives me back a data frame with all of the rows in it. But we can see again here on the left that every one of them is labeled San Jose. And then if we wanted to do kind of end up back at the same place we were when we did column rows. This time we're going to do rows column, but we'll end up with the same thing. If we do monthly.loc San Jose, and then get the precip column from that, it'll be the same thing. So two ways to do that. When you want to get a specific column, you do the indexing directly on the data frame variable. When you want to get a group of rows, do the indexing using the dot loc attributes. And then from there, you can do additional row indexing if you want. Um, you can, or you can grab a column. As you've kind of seen, we can kind of go both directions. So a quick summary of that. All right, so that gave us a column. Oops. That gave us rows. And this gives us a series, which is the name of the pandas data type that has like that is just one column. Doing this gives us back a data frame, but it gives us a smaller data frame probably. It gives us a subset of the original table. Okay. So exercise. So load the data again using read CSV, but the same file. 
into and then um, extract only the data for the month of July. There's your exercise. And I want to hear chatting. Work with your neighbor. Demerits if I don't hear chatting. <laughs> OK. So let's walk through it. So we'll start off by getting the data again from the file. And then, oops, set index. Um, so there's a month column. So we'll use that. And then let's take a quick look at it. So all of the data, and then we see month names over there. Um, and we can't see all of them, but they're all three letters. And we can see all of them. Um, this was, I, I printed this out in case you hadn't figured it out. Um, not monthly, month. Those are all of the month names. So they, it's, it's the first three letters like every time first one capitalized to get that. Um, OK, so I think most everybody got this far, setting the month in the index so that we can grab just July. Um, and then I saw quite a few people doing data precip with the JUL to get um, the July data. So what does this give you? A volunteer, please. Just, just the precept on July. Right. So it gives you the precept data for the July. But now you don't know, you know, you don't have the station and all the rest of the information associated with that, or the year, for example. Um, so how do you get the entire table with just the rows for July? Let's try it. OK, so I get an error. And if we scroll down far enough, it says key error, J-U-L. That's because this kind, indexing data like this, it's looking for a column named J-U-L. Anybody remember what we did to get rows? The dot L-O-C, dot loc. So when you're trying to get a column, go like this. When you're trying to get rows, like this. So that's one tricky thing about pandas is you have to be quite explicit about whether uh, and use forethought to consider whether you are grabbing a column or multiple columns or whether you are grabbing a row or multiple rows and uh, use dot loc or not appropriately. Right, so there we got the whole table. Is everyone clear about the difference between the columns and rows in a data frame? So a column in a data frame usually contains like kind of the same information about every row, right? Not, and so the values aren't the same, but it's the same measurement or the same metadata about every row. So in our case, we've got, for example, the station name, right? So the station column 
contains the station name that applies to every row. And when we display this, usually the columns kind of go across horizontally. So column, column, column. And then the rows are going down vertically. Um, so that was the tricky part of that exercise. Yeah, question? Yep, it, it means grab every row that has the label of JUL. And that's and so that set index was important where I did here where we did set index month. If we hadn't done that, this wouldn't work. Because the dot using dot loc only looks in the index. It doesn't look at the values in the rest of the row. It only looks at that index label. So if you had done um, set index of that region for something that would have been So if, if we had set it to something else, like so before I did, if we look at the monthly variable that I still have sitting around here, here the index is the station. And I can grab rows by doing monthly dot loc San Jose for example. Um, but I cannot, for example, use, I cannot, for well, I, I can put um, JUL here, um, but it'll tell me that there is nothing, no label JUL in the index. So there certainly are rows that have a JUL in the month column, but dot loc only looks in the index. So the difference there is what we're putting into the index that allows us to use dot loc. All right, any questions about that exercise? So when you're using pandas, you very you, you have to be a bit thoughtful about whether you're working on, on columns or rows and, uh, and kind of work with the data frame appropriately. Okay, and very quickly, I'll just demonstrate um, Saving data, so we had that read CSV. Um, there is a handy to CSV. So if I wanted to save out just the San Jose data, for example, I can do monthly San Jose dot to CSV and pass it a file name. And it will write that out, and then we can do dot the exclamation point head san jose.csv to take a look at that right so now we've kind of very quickly created uh, a text file with that subset of the data we created it even prints out the the index in as the first column so we still have, but it's the same for every row in our case, but it, it does put that there, the San Jose values. So two CSV, pretty handy. Um, Could you go back up? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, so if, if something scrolls off my screen, which it does very quickly, um, the, uh, Osley is copying everything I type into the etherpad. Thank you, Osley. Um, and just as there are, um, whoops. Just there, as there are a lot of to or read blank functions, there are a lot of two blank methods on data frames. Um, so they've really got you covered. Some of them, they, they, some of them like create new files, like 2CSV does, that writes a new file to disk. Other one, other of these kind of transform the data into something new and then give that back to you. Um, so this can also do things like, um, 
convert it to a um, to a bunch of Python dictionaries, for example. And so, so instead of having a, a data frame, you would have like a dictionary of dictionaries and lists, or a list of dictionaries, depending on the options you give it. But so, but but pandas is pretty much just as useful reading thing writing things out as it is reading things in. Okay, so I'm going to move on to doing aggregate computations. Um, first thing I want to do is reset the index. So right now, monthly has the station name in the index. I want to get rid of that. I want to move that back into the columns as one of the columns of data. And that's what reset index does. Reset index takes whatever's in your index and puts it back into the data as a column. So now I'm back to having 0, 1, 2, 3 in the index over here. And station is back in the data as a column. Whenever you don't specify an index to pandas, it creates an integer index that goes from 0 to the number of rows minus 1. So it just kind of creates, like, it always has an index no matter if you don't specify one. Like, there's a default one. Um, so once we have reset the index and got back to our original data, and the reason I'm doing this um, is because there are some things we want to do that operate on the columns. Like I want to be able to specify the station column. Um, and when it was an index, it wasn't, it was like a column, but not quite a column. So what we're going to look at is um, what are called group by operations. So for something like this data, we have a lot of different labels for the the rows, right? Um, we've got the station names. Those are unique to an individual station. Uh, abbreviation is also unique to an individual station. Um, I don't know this like just by magically looking at this data. I know this because I have because I created the data. But just FYI. Um, so these are unique. If you want just the column names, column, yeah. dot columns. So monthly dot columns or your data frame dot columns prints just the column names. Um, but if we look, if we were to look in more detail at the region column, we would see that there are many stations per region or many stations per subregion, and many subregions per region, right? So there's kind of this hierarchical categorization to this data. And with, um, and there's multiple years, for example. There's multiple, there are measurements, uh, there are multiple measurements per year, and there are multiple years of measurements for every station. Um, so a lot of different ways we can kind of group this, right? We can say, give me all of the data in a certain subregion or a certain region, or all of the data in 19, 92 or something like that. So there are a lot of different kind of ways to slice and group this data. And pandas is fantastic for this. So we're going to use something called group by, which is where we can say group by. We can say take a column and group together all of the rows that have the same value in that column. And I'm going to get really fancy here and actually give it two values, the station and the year. So can anybody think about, like, let's think a little bit about what we expect this to do. Any thoughts? Sort 
Right. So it's going to grab every column or every row with the same station and group them first. And then within that group, it's going to group it again by year so that all of the rows from the same station and the same year are together. Right. Um, anybody want to, want to hazard a guess how many rows are in each of those groups? <laughs> These are monthly observations. So when we group by year, we get 12 observations per year, per group. Um, so what happens when we actually execute that? We don't get anything pretty out of that um, because uh, it would be kind of hard to print, right? Because I've just made like, um, there are 28 years and a couple of hundred stations. So like, this is a lot of groups, right? Um, in fact, I can find out how many by using the len on that. There are 5,200 groups there. And, um, and Pandas actually kind of waits to like group all of those and serve them all up until you actually use them. Um, so we kind of need to keep going to really get utility out of this. But we can, for example, get, just like we could grab columns off of the original data frame, we can grab the exact same columns off of this grouped thing. And again, it's nothing pretty because it's a whole bunch of groups. But we can access that and grab out an individual grouped column. But let's really see the power of this. Let's do some aggregation. So I've made all of these groups, right? Let's think about what's going to happen here. If I do some. All right, so I've got my group. GB, this grouped by table, grouped table. I'm grabbing just the precip data, and then I'm doing sum. So going back to the groups, we grouped by station, then year. So we have essentially every station's data across all of the uh, per year, right? So we have state the first station's data in 1987 and then the second station's data in 1987, and then the third station's data in 1987, and so on. Um, so what happens when we call sum on that? Sorry, I couldn't hear you very well. Yep, exactly. So if I can repeat that, it's going to be every, it's going to sum every station's data from each particular year, right? So it's going to do the sum per group, not across all of the data. In contrast, if I had done monthly precip.sum, I would get back one number adding up all of the, adding up the precip column across all of the table. But doing it this way, I get station Aiden RS, 1987, got 10 inches. 1988, got 8 inches. 1989, got 14 inches. And if we scroll down a bit, we see another one. And it gets cut off here because uh, it decided not to show me the entire notebook, or the entire thing, thankfully. Um, but you know, here's Yosemite, here's Wairika, right? So very quickly, we've gone from like this big table of monthly observations to a 1D structure of yearly observations. And that's all we did. Make sense to folks? 
And uh, you'll remember .sum from NumPy. Um, pandas things have a lot of the same methods as NumPy things. .sum, .mean, um, min, max, that kind of thing. Um, and in fact, you can, you can, as, as you'll see here, uh, or you can kind of, uh, pandas is built on top of NumPy, so there's a lot of interoperability between pandas and NumPy. Like if NumPy does something that pandas doesn't that you really need, like there's a way to make that work. But most of it has kind of transparently works in, in pandas. Um, and this next one, I might paste into the etherpad. Um, there's an apply. So sometimes you want to do something a little fancier to um, these. So sometimes, so we've got some, we've got mean. Sometimes we want to do a little, something a little fancier, like calculate sum and mean, or mean and standard deviation for every one of those groups. And for that, there's an apply method where you pass it a function. Um, that function then in turn gets access to the group data, and you can do things with it and then return something new. So let me, let me write this out, um, and then we can explain it. Since we didn't get a ton of practice with uh, functions. So we're going to, data is going to be the data from each one of our groups. And then we're going to calculate the mean and standard deviation of the data in each of those groups. But we're going to pass, we're going to return a series on that, of that data. Um, we're going to label that data. So just like our um, data frame and, and the series we've been working with so far, we've seen data labeled with um, the station name or labeled with the month abbreviations. Here we're creating a series where the data is labeled by the type of statistic it is, mean or standard deviation. And then you can name a series. So when you pull a series out of a data frame, its name is the name of whatever that column was. Um, but you can also name things uh, a series on its own. And we're going to call it the same thing as whatever the data coming in is. Um, and then that's the whole function. And then we're going to use the group by again, precip, precip dot apply, and then we pass in our function. So I, Osley, I'm sure, has got this. If you want to just copy this out of the etherpad instead of typing all of that. So what's going to happen here? So let's think about what what is data going to be when this function is actually used in, inside of pandas, right? So we're calling it on the group by and we're getting only the precip data. All right, so that's this data structure that we've been looking at here, where we've got um, where, and actually this is reduced, right? Like our, our actual groups, there are, there are 12 data points bet between each of these rows. This has been summed. Um, so what is data going to be when this function gets called? Thank you. So when we call this with the group by, this data is going to be the precip data from each group. And we've got 5,200 groups, so this function is going to be called 5,200 times, passing in the precip data from each of those groups. Um, and, then the, um, and then Pandas is going to com compile everything that's coming back from that to give us kind of a neat um, this takes a second to give us kind of a neat thing where we've got station, year, 
mean, and standard deviation. This is a series. It's one dimensional, but it's got a very, it's got like a three layered index. The outer layer, the station name, in the middle, the year, and then the inner layer are statistics. Um, this can get a little unwieldy when you've got like this much index going on. Um, so you can convert it pretty quickly into um, a table where we'll have one row for station year and then the statistics kind of in the columns. And we do that with, actually I need to copy this whole thing. Copy this. We say unstack. And unstack means take, uh, with, with no arguments like this, it means take the innermost layer of the index of this series. So this index, uh, this series has three layers, station, year, statistic. We're gonna take just the inner one, statistic, and convert it into a couple, into two columns. One for the mean and one for the standard deviation. All right, so now we've got station and year are still in the index, but now mean and standard deviation are um, columns so that we're back to having kind of one row per station year, which is one row per group as we're Yeah. This sort of thing is really useful for like, I, I use this type of thing a lot where I write a function that computes multiple statistics, especially when I'm doing like computing like a confidence interval where or percentile, so I might want like, you know, 2.5% and then 7.5% in the medium. So one quick thing to note here is that I did, when I created this group GB variable, I did monthly dot group by, and then I passed in a list of station and year. And that ordering was important, right? Because my data came out with the index being station year. And if I had swapped those, what do you think would happen, right? If we had done group by year station, we'd have year on the outside and then station on the inside. So that ordering to the group by was important. Um, so we have another exercise on group by. Um, so one person asked about this last time, what I was, do how I got my text to look like it did when I wrote out that last exercise. Um, I hid my menu. Toolbar. And. Huh. Okay. Um, I used a keyboard shortcut to convert. So I've. You'll notice you can kind of select cells. This cell has kind of a, a light gray outline around it, meaning this is selected. And then here from this drop down where it says code, you can convert it to other types. I converted it to markdown. And then this is a little box where you type text, uh, specifically markdown, but you don't need to worry about that. You can look that up later. Um, but now it's not code. It's not something that Python is going to try to execute. It's something where you can write information, um, sort of like code comments, but prettier. Um, so that's what I did. Um, so really, I, I want you to just play with group by. Um, I'm going to write out kind of a, an exercise, but I don't care if you finish the exercise. Um, I really want you to run group by a few things and like see what happens when you group by region, right? Or see what when subregion and what does each of those things mean? Um, and do like aggregate statistics on it, like mean or um, or some. Um, 
and kind of think about what each of those things mean. But I'll write out an exercise here too, in case you uh, want to go for it. So you'll want to start not from this GB variable that I've been using, but create a new one starting from the monthly data frame. One thing to think about is how does this differ from the example I was just giving? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Like, what what's different about this calculation than the one we were just doing? <laughs> we have three values, three things. Where the rest of no, we did. We had three things before. All right. So, what did we calculate before? Just now, um, we calculated the. The mean, we calculated the total, but we could have also calculated the mean. But like, we calculated the total yearly precipitation for each station, right? Now we're interested in the average yearly precipitation for each region. So we're still looking at yearly, right? But we're interested in grouping at a different level by region, not by station. So if we want to group by region and year, before we did station year, to group by station and year, region is a column in this data frame, so we can do region and year instead, right? And then to grab just the um, precipitation, same as before, right? And then to calculate the mean, the mean, right? And then let's look at what that is. So this is a much smaller data set now that we've we've created right because before we were grouping by station and there are a lot of stations now we're grouping by region and there are only a few regions there's uh 
11 or 13 or something. Um, but it's much less data, right? Um, but it makes sense, right? We've got region, then 1987, and 1988, and then we go down, we've got another region in 87 and 88, and so on. So did we see how I did that? So pretty much the same as before, but thinking about what we were using to do the group, the grouping. Before we were getting the precipitation by station, now we're doing it by region. But again, we kind of, we changed one thing, right? We changed the name of a column in this group by mm -hmm. and calculated something totally mm -hmm. different, right? Totally changed the scale at which we were doing aggregation. Okay, so the second part of this is to um, actually, I, this is wrong. This doesn't return a data frame. This returns a series. But we want to turn it into a data frame where the regions are the row labels and the years are the column labels. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, I think this is the look. Not the look. Unstack? Unstack is to move things from the index to the columns, from, from row labels to column labels, use unstack. Anybody want to make bets about whether there's a stack uh, method? That's a silly bet, right? Of course there's a stack method. So you can, if you have, a, if you have kind of a wide data frame where you want to move the, the, the um, column labels into an index and create a series, use stack. If you have a series with a hierarchical index where you want to move stuff from the row labels to the columns, use unstack. Um, so we've got by region preset mean dot unstack. All right, so now we've got a nice 2D table of region, one region per row, and then the years going across the columns. Any questions about uh, the grouping? It is, uh, the, the grouping is a, an, an extraordinarily powerful feature of pandas. Um, that that I, I, I use, we use it at work like a lot. Um, I work with uh, city planning professionals um, and so we have data across kind of wide geographic scales. Um, so you might have at a high level something like a zone and then at a small level something like a parcel or a building. Um, these are all kind of, uh, you know, assessor data terms um, from cities that we work with. Um, and if we want to add up, for example, like how many buildings are in a zone or how many people live in a zone, the number of people is in the buildings table. Um, but, uh, and, and we don't keep that data in the zones table, right? If we want that, we have to do something like group by the zone on the buildings table and then add up all the number of people there. And now we know how many people are in each zone in the data, for example. Um, I didn't, we, we won't demo this, but you can also loop over a group by and operate individually on each group, which is sort of what apply does for you behind the scenes, but you can do it kind of front and center yourself too. And that's another thing we do um, a bit where we want to kind of like loop over people, grouping them by a certain characteristic um, at work, like 
um, maybe an age category or something or, or some kind of demographic category where we want to loop over the different demographics, you can do that with group by as well. Um, anytime you're like, I have this, I have this classifier in my data and I want to group, I want to go through that looking at each group in that, um, you can use group by and let pandas do all the sorting and meshing things together for you. Okay, we're almost done with pandas, and then we will take another break. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about, so group, uh, group by is one way to sort of say, hey pandas, put my data into this, these subsets. Um, but you don't always want to subset by a group. Um, sometimes you want to subset by continuous data, like, income or height or, or something like that, where you're like, I want all of, where you haven't, you haven't kind of created a class for it. You're keeping a continuous variable or something. Um, or you do have a class, but you want to um, get, you want to kind of group them multiple classes into the same group. So we're gonna talk a bit about filtering data like that. So going back to the monthly data frame, um, we've already seen um, one way to do this with the indexing, right? We put the month into the index, and then we said dot loc, and uh, put in jul, and we got back all of the July data. That's one way to subset, is to use dot loc, and whatever's in the index. Um, if you don't have, like right now, monthly does not have helpful data in the index. It's just 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Um, but the useful data is still there, right? It's still there. The month data is still there in the columns. The station name is still there in the columns, and so on. Um, and we can use that to pull out to, to get certain sets, subsets of the data. So I'm going to use .loc again. Um, and this is going to look very familiar after our last uh, NumPy tutorial. So we saw this right at the end of Jess's NumPy notebook where we took a NumPy array, the brackets, and then we put in an expression saying like where the data is less than 0.5. Right? So one way to use .loc is to, well, let's think a little bit about what this expression does. Given our NumPy experience, what do we think this does? And what does it give you back? Yep, it gives you back a Boolean mask, where it's true, where the station is San Jose, and false, where it's not. And then you can, just like with NumPy, where you could pass that Boolean mask back in as an index and get the subset of the data where it's true, that works with .loc in exactly the same way. So you can see station is San Jose here. And then over here in the index, like we had to go down 300 rows. So we just chopped off the first 300 rows because none of them had station uh, San Jose. And uh, then it skips here at one point where we have to go through a whole bunch more stations to get to kind of the next set of data where San Jose shows up. So Boolean indexing works in pandas just like it works in NumPy. Lovely. Um, but one thing you end up wanting to do quite a bit more in pandas is uh, get a subset of the data where multiple things are true. Um, one way to do that is to use uh, um, this really useful method called isIn. All right, so I'm accessing the month data of the complete data frame, and then I'm going to pass in here a list. Sorry, this is getting a little bit nested. And so let's think about just this part, the is in part, 
So again, what do we think that is going to give us? Right? Yeah, so this is like, say you wanted the winter, just the winter months, right? This will return true everywhere that the month is December, January, or February, and false everywhere it's not. That is, and, and that is everywhere that the month is in this sequence, and false everywhere where it's not. Um, and we could have written this out using like the equal equal, like three different equal equals doing month equals December, or month equals January, or month equals February. But a lot of the time, but that takes a lot of typing, and a lot of, this is a shortcut for that. So here is our, um, here is our winter data. So if we go over here to the month column, December, January, February, December, January, February, December, January, February, and so on. So we've created a table of, of winter data. And one more. When you start to, when you're, when you're, the things you want to filter start to get a little complicated, um, it can get um, unwieldy to combine all of the different conditions on which you want to filter. Like say you have conditions on like three or four columns or something. Um, combining all of those up can get a, a bit unwieldy using, um, for example, this syntax, right? Because to filter on multiple of these, you have to write out an expression like this for every single one of them and then combine them into one Boolean mask before you can start subsetting the data. The query method allows you to pass in a string that expresses all of that stuff, and then it takes care of it for you. So as an example, you'll notice I'm kind of nesting strings here. I'm using single quotes on the outside and then double quotes on the inside to kind of, uh, and the reason I'm using the double, I'm using double quotes inside only because I use single quotes outside. Um, if you have single quotes on the outside, you can use double quotes on the outside without it terminating your string, um, and vice versa. But so, I'm, but I'm indicating that this is a string, and then um, and then we're going to get complicated. Um, I'm going to put this on a new line so it gets a little bit more space, and then say I want to do the month thing again. I want just the winter month from the San Francisco Bay Area. And I need an and in here. All right, let me, sorry, this is not fitting. I can kind of put it on two lines here so that fits. And the key thing here, the really critical bit, this should look familiar and this should look familiar, but you'll notice I don't have to put monthly in front of the column names. I can write the column names by themselves. And so these are assumed to be column names in the table. This is the really critical bit right here, this and. All right, we talked a little bit yesterday with Katie about the Booleans and what happens when you put things together with or or and. If you use or, the whole expression is true if either side is true. And with and, the whole expression is only true if both sides are true. So here, this will only be true when the region is San Francisco Bay and the month is December, January, or February. I could put or there, that's valid, but then I would get data either when the data is, when the region is, is San Francisco Bay or the month is December, January, February. 
and let's see what happens. Cool. So region, San Francisco Bay, that checks out. And then if we go over to the month, December, January, Feb, December, January, Feb, and so on. So that can come in handy. Um, and so your final exercise, we're almost done. Use any of the filtering methods I just talked about to um, get the subset of the table for uh, for the region um, Colorado. River. And then if you feel like getting really fancy, try to get, try to filter that again to get just the data from 1999. All right, let's get back to business. Um, so you can, you can save and close your Pandas notebook. And we are going to open up this plotting notebook. So once you've closed the pandas one, go back to the list of all of the notebooks and click on the one called plotting.ipynb. So I clicked on, if you can get back to here, to where you see the list of all the notebooks, the one called plotting. Just plotting, not plotting solutions. You can close the other one or leave it open. It doesn't matter. Um, let me get rid of this toolbar. And header. And OK. And uh, so this time, everything's typed in here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of just run through this. The first thing we're going to do is run this special command that starts with a percent sign. That percent sign means just like the exclamation point earlier meant this is a shell command. Go run this at the shell. Things that start with, an, with a percent sign are special mat, uh, IPython commands. So this is telling this matplotlib inline is saying, IPython, when I make plots, show them here in the notebook. If you don't do that, it will try to show them in a separate window. But for this exercise, we want them to show up here in the notebook. So we run that. And then we import pandas. Um, and for starters here, we're kind of learning about matplotlib, but we're going to start from the perspective of pandas, because pandas has some uh, plotting utilities with it. So import pandas, and we're going to load that same data, that same familiar monthly data frame. Um, and then group it to yearly and get the mean precipitation for every year, so just the precipitation. Something and try to do the shift. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So this only printed five rows because I did dot head. Head works on both series and uh, data frames. Um, and then we're going to do the simplest possible thing. We've got this series of year in the index and then um, the mean amount of precipitation that year and the values, and we're going to say yearly.plot, the most like basic, simple thing we can do here. And there's a plot. Right. So across the index of that series ended up on the x-axis, 
the years across the x-axis because those were the the index and then the values of the series end up on the y-axis so this is the mean amount of precipitation in that year yeah so you can see the last couple of years have not been good for us um, so if all you if you've got a series with some numbers in it, um, actually numbers in both the index and the values, pretty easy to make a line plot, just dot plot. Right. Let's try again. Um, here I'm taking the monthly data, so same kind of thing, um, where I'm grouping by region this time and getting the mean precipitation. All right, so there it is. Um, this time, when I do regional dot plot, I'm going to say kind equals bar, instead of before I did nothing, and we got the default plot, which is a line plot, with kind equals bar. Surprise, a bar plot. Um, with the the region labels down here, so we can see the parts of California where it rains a lot, like the North Coast, and the parts where it doesn't rain a lot, like. Colorado River, um, which is south uh, southeastern California. Um, I find that plot a little bit easier to read if we first uh, sorted it. Um, and so we're doing that same regional data. Now we're sorting it. Um, I'm doing in place equals false. Uh, by default, we saw yesterday with Thomas that um, when you do like a list dot sort, it does it in place. It doesn't give you a new list. Um, but by passing in place, and that, it's the true of series and data frames too, but by passing in place equals false here, we can get a new series without affecting the underlying data, and then call plot on that. And now we see it ordered, which I find a bit easier to read and compare things. There's a little link here that you can follow if you're curious where each of these regions is. Um, California is divided up into these, what, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hydrological regions. Now, if you have a data frame with uh, different data um, of the same kind, like the same kind across each of the columns, you can get multiple things on your plot. So multiple bars, multiple lines, etc. So let's create a data frame like that. So we're going to group by year and region, get the precip data, get the mean. Take a quick look at that. All right, so year, this looks familiar. It's a series with a multi level index, year on the outside, region on the inside, and then the mean precipitation. <clears throat> but this is a series, we want a data frame. So the uh, familiar unstack method. Here I'm specifying the level to use for unstack. Before, we've always not used an argument there. We've gone with the default, which is the innermost layer. Um, and I could have done that here, because region is the innermost level of the index. But I'm just being specific about it. So now we've got a data frame with year in the index, and then the regions across the columns. And we need to be deliberate about this because whatever's in the index is going to end up as the x-axis of our plot. So if we had done this the other way around, so that region was in the index and year was up here, region would have been the x-axis of the plot. And we'd probably get a bar chart. But in this case, year is uh, the index, and we can plot this. I'm being a little bit specific about a few things here, like I want a line plot. That's the default, default, but I'm being specific. I'm saying I want the figure to be a certain size. I want it to have a curtain, certain color palette. And I want the lines to be wider than the default, which is one.
I know you probably can't read any of the stuff on the plot from the back. But great. Um, but that's a lot of lines. It gets a bit hard to read. Um, we can use, we can change the kind to a box plot to kind of look at things by region. It's kind of like a bar chart, but it shows you the variability every year. Um, and I used a little, I used this rotate keyword to make it rotate the uh, labels down here so they don't end up running over each other. And if you look up the documentation for pandas, you can find the documentation for the plot keyword and um, read about all of the different kinds and the different options. And the docs, by the way, are at pandas.pydata.org, but Google will get you there just as fast. You question? Yeah, um, I, I assume these are some sort of binary files for, for Mac. Um, <clears throat> the figures? Um, um, it is. We will see an example of that. Um, you'll notice that this is printing out something here. Um, when we call dot plot, it's actually giving us back um, a matplotlib data type. And working with that, you can save the figure. And I bet there's a, there's a keyword to plot that you can tell it, save it to a file, like give it a file name, and it'll save it to a file. Um, and you, matplotlib supports several different output formats, like PDF, PostScript, JPEG, PNG, um, um, maybe GIF, um, TIFF, like a lot of things. And we'll see an example of, whoops, what happened. I don't know where my Chrome just went. That was, oh, I'm full screen, way over here. Okay, um, we're gonna skip the exercise. Okay, so that was using the dot plot method of data frame and series. Now we'll move on to doing things directly with matplotlib, which is when you really need to take control of the figures is kind of what you have to do. Like the plot on the, the pandas things is handy, um, but it, it gets tricky to control a lot of the detail if, if you need to do so. Um, so you might need to work directly with matplotlib. As we saw yesterday, most of the functionality is in this matplotlib.pyplot uh, module and we rename it to PLT, and we'll see what the style is used for in a minute. Um, when, um, so we're gonna get some data. This cell is just to get some data to plot. We're going to plot, instead of plotting the Precip column from the data, we're going to plot the percent of average column, which is the ratio of how much rain actually fell to how much rain usually falls, or on average, anyway. Um, so that's the data we're going to plot. Now, one thing about matplotlib is it starts to get a little bit more verbose. When you're working with matplotlib, you need to get a hold of something actually on which to draw your plots. Um, <clears throat> and we do that with the subplots function. And I'm getting back from that a figure and an axis variable. Um, the figure is sort of the highest level container for things in matplotlib. And then an axis is one individual plot. So in this case, we're just going to have one plot in our figure, but you can imagine having several, right? In a figure, you might have several subplots. So that's why we kind of do this. Um, so if we run that, we get this plot, which is 
you can see on the y-axis it goes up to like 200. So we grouped by year, we did the mean, um, and then we did this plot. So it's pretty similar to the one we did before, but it's, it's different data now, but the same kind of plot across all of the years. Um, and you can see that doing axes.plot gave us a line plot, kind of the same way that the default output when we did this in with the data or the series.plot was, was a line plot. So dot plot is a line plot. But now that we have this axes object, we can start to modify things about the plot. We can set the X label, set the Y label, set the title, turn on the grid. And so now with the grid, it's a bit easier to see where the 100% is line, like where the average is. And then, and so those are all things we modified on the axes. So they were all related to kind of the plot. But if we actually want to save the file out to disk, we use the figure, the, the higher level container. And we do fig.savefig and give it a name. <clears throat> and the, um, the, the suffix of this, the extension, tells matplotlib what format to save it as. So I said, I'm, this is PNG. I could do PDF, for example. So that's how you set the file format. And now, if we were to go look, like that would be a thing on my computer that we could that I could open up in an image editor or embed in some other document. Okay, so um, Matplotlib's default style is not the prettiest, um, and they're aware of that. They have this thing called style sheets that you can customize if you want. You can kind of make your own style sheet and load it before you start plotting in, in matplotlib, and will, that will override matplotlib's defaults. But they've also got some cool built-in ones. If we look at style.available, these are the names of all of the built-in styles. Um, and then we can actually turn one on using style.use and pass in the name of one of these. So I like the BMH one. And now all of the subsequent plotting we do will have this style. And you'll see the difference here when we recreate that plot. Now it looks like that, which I personally think is an improvement. Um, so if you get a little sick of, of matplotlib's default styles, these built-in ones get you a good bit of the way, and then you can start to customize them as you like. Um, and and the, that doesn't, when we do style.use, this isn't in effect for just, um, just that one plot. It stays in effect until something cancels it out, like you restart the notebook or you set another style or something. OK, so far we've just made some line plots. Lovely. Um, we might want to add a marker to it so we can see where the actual data points are, because line, line plots can kind of hide that. So the difference here, so when I called x.plot, I'm passing in the x data and the y data. And just like with our pandas plots, we want the data in the index to be the x data and the values from yearly to be the y data. So I can pass in yearly.index and yearly as the x and y data. And the difference I'm doing now is I'm saying marker equals o. And uh, now I get circles for the markers. And there are a whole bunch of other ones of these that you can choose from, like pluses and diamonds and stars and uh, dots and a lot of things. Um, and you can also adjust the line style. Um, and again, there are several choices here. One of them is if you supply an empty string, that will turn the line off and give you just the markers, like this. 
I don't think that works super well for this plot, but, um, and in fact, so now it looks like a scatter plot, but this isn't really a scatter plot. This is like a line plot because the data are sequential. Um, matplotlib won't do it for you. You have to use another utility to calculate that line. Um, if you're making an actual scatter plot where the data points are all independent, you would use axe.scatter, not axe.plot, FYI. Um, okay, let's get into subplots. So when we, when, we did, when we did that group by region and then plotted the data, um, we ended up with 10 lines all in one plot. But we might want to instead make 10 plots with one line per plot. And so that's subplots. So now this time when I'm calling the subplots function, I'm saying n rows equals 10, n coles equals 1. So I'm going to get 10 rows stacked. And you can put in as many as you want. Um, and I'm setting the fig figure size over here and specifying that they'll all have the same x-axis. And that gave me, so far I've gotten 10 empty plots here. We'll fix that. But what is the axes thing? The axes that I got back this time, instead of being one thing, every time previous to this, I've gotten back one axis. This time, I've gotten an array of 10 axes. And to plot on these, I need to kind of individually loop over the data I want to plot and the axes on which I want that data to be plotted. Um, so I'm going to kind of recreate my data. So you can see this big line here has got a group by, grab the percent of average, calculate the mean, and unstack it to give me that data frame again. That we're from. So now we've got data frame, year, and the rows um, across the columns, the regions. And we're going to loop over the columns here. I'm using this function zip to allow me to loop over both the columns and the axes at the same time. So that here's the column names, and then here's the axes. So every time through, I'm going to get one of the column names and one of the axes going through this loop. And remember, the column names are the regions. And so every time through, I'm going to grab that column of data from the data frame and then plot it using a line plot on that one axis using the index as the x values and the values from the series as the y values. And there they are. Um, it would be nice to label these so we knew which region was which and uh, maybe put them all on the y-axis, same y-axis, so we can compare them. Just looking this over, I can see that we probably want it to go down to zero, and then the max is about 250. So I'm going to kind of just manually do that. You could also use, for example, the min and max methods to find that info out about your data. I'm just going to look at this plot. So almost the same code here, but now I'm doing things with the axis. I'm setting the x label to year, setting the y label, setting the y limit, and setting the title. Each time through this loop, as each of those axes comes through, I'm setting these properties of it, of the axes. So this time through, there are my region names, but it's all gotten a bit squished together. Like, I didn't allow enough space between the things. Luckily, that's not something you usually have to take care of ahead of time. I can say like, okay, I'm done. I've got all of the things on my plot that I want to be there. And I can say, hey, figure, lay yourself out so nothing overlaps using this tight layout method. And if we run that, now it's kind of taken care of. It squished every one of those plots a little bit so that the labels don't overlap. And now if I wanted, I could save this out. 
So that's subplots. So you kind of have to manually say, like, give me this many number of subplots, and they'll be in a grid. Um, and then you loop over them in whatever way you'd like it to go, putting stuff on those one at a time. And finally, we're going to talk about Seaborn. Um, Seaborn is a, a separate plotting library built on top of Matplotlib. Um, for one thing, Seaborn has kind of a different look and feel than Matplotlib. The default styles are different. But it also implements a few kinds of statistical plots um, that it can generate much uh, with much less work than you would do in Matplotlib to make the equivalent plot if it's the kind of plot you want. So we're going to import Seaborn. And uh, here I'm using yearly.plot. Uh, this is the data frame plot. But just importing Seaborn has changed the style that we're going to see coming out of this, because it's changed matplotlib styles. It doesn't come with, OK. So you, I guess, so Seaborn doesn't come with Anaconda. Um, so you'll just have to observe this part. Um, and you can install that later. Um, so, same plot as before, but the style has changed. The grid looks different. Um, the axes lines have disappeared and so on. So this is just Seaborn's um, styling at work. And again, the bar chart looks different. No outlines on the bars. Um, and the box plot is kind of a little different. Um, with, um, but Seaborn has a kind of plot called a violin plot that's similar to a box plot, um, but shows a little bit better the distribution of the data underneath these boxes. So we're going to create a data frame to work on. So one thing about Seaborn is that it can more easily work with, with data in data frames. It kind of more natively understands data frames. And so when you kind of pass it a data frame in this long format, um, we can tell it the x is the region column and the y is the precip column. And it knows how to work with that data frame. So you're saying these are columns in the data frame. And then you say data equals df. And we get a violin plot of that. Um, so a lot, it's the same data as the box plot, but now the shape of the violin tells us where the data are concentrated. And then Seaborn has these facet grids um, that allow you to kind of quickly draw a plot across a bunch of grids. Um, so this kind of quickly recreated that other thing in two lines that we spent several lines doing before to make these subplots. And finally, um, pair plots where things are compared to each other. So this is going to create a big grid where it compares the different variables to each other. Like this. So you can kind of see, it's not <clears throat> super meaningful with this data, except that you can see these histograms. Um, but it, it's plotting every region's data against every other region's data, uh, specifically the precipitation. All right, so that's Seaborn. All right, so that's plotting. How are we doing on time? Cool. Um, so your whirlwind introduction to, to Matplotlib and a little bit of Seaborn. Um, there are other things out there, and I will I'll kind of cover them in the next bit. But any questions?
It's the last bit. Um, there is a link to this slideshow from the Etherpad. So I'm going to run through a quick slideshow, just mentioning the names of some scientific Python things and what they're used for. Let's see if this looks good, if I make it any bigger. OK, so what have we covered so far? We have covered NumPy with the arrays and matrices. We've covered pandas with the tables, the data frames, and the columns series, and matplotlib for the plotting, and uh, Seaborn for some other kinds of plotting. Um, and, and those are pretty core, like NumPy, pandas, and matplotlib are, are very kind of the core foundational things that you are going to see all the time and hear talked about all the time. And here's the rest. Well, not all of the rest. There's a really long list. But like here's the next tier. Um, so SciPy, if you think of NumPy as sort of like the container, the, the arrays are like containers for numbers. Or if you think about pandas as containers for numbers, SciPy is where all the algorithms are. Um, so there's more linear algebra. Um, there's signal processing. There's statistics. There's ordinary differential equations. There's optimization and minimization. Um, so this is your like Fourier transforms and splines and interpolation and uh, just like all kinds of fancy statistical functions like gamma functions and all kinds of stuff. Um, but this is like when you're like, I need an algorithm for x or y, SciPy is the first place to look. It's got some image processing. Um, it, it wraps up a bunch of old Fortran libraries that do linear algebra um, and C libraries uh, to give you a Python interface to that. Osley, did you have a comment? I was saying numerical integration. Numerical integration, yep. Um, so a quick example of using um, something in the optimize to find the minimum of a function and uh, getting a PDF of the normal distribution from scipy.stats. Um, so stats models is a library that works very closely with pandas for doing all kinds of statistical modeling, way more than I have much expertise in. Um, here's an example of, of doing um, just a very simple ordinary least squares regression on some random data. And then it gives you this great table of results um, telling you the quality of the fits and the Bayesian information criterion and summary of your data and all kinds of stuff. I don't know what most of this stuff is. Um, but if you're doing a lot of like statistical regression, um, stats models is your thing. Patsy works with stats models to allow you to write your your models as like strings that look like equations, which is handy. Um, so in this example, we've got some data set and um, apparently has something to do with the lottery. So we're actually writing out this model expression in Patsy. And then under the hood, stats models is using Patsy to translate from this um, equation. Uh, so dat is a data frame. And lottery and literacy and pop 1831 are all columns in that data frame. And so it knows to relate the lottery variable to the literacy and the transformation of the population. And, um, but it's still the ordinary least squares. Um, and then you get this some familiar table. So Patsy is nice for allowing you to kind of just write, throw all your data into one big data frame, and then write a formula that's easy to read and understand your model.
Scikit-learn does machine learning, shockingly. Um, a quick example using support vector machine classifier. Um, but if you want to do any machine learning, the first place to look is scikit-learn. SymPy does symbolic math, a bit like Mathematica um, or Maple. Um, So it takes a few lines of code, but you can define a symbol x, define, define an integral over x, that's the exponent, and then the cosine, and then say, hey, compute that for me. Like, and it's, it's not doing numerical integration, it's actually solving that for you and giving you the real result. So it's sort of like a little like Wolfram Alpha, or like Wolfram in your pocket, you know? Um, and it's very prettily formatted too. So this slideshow was generated in, a, in an IPython notebook. And so if you use SymPy in a notebook, you will get this very pretty output, like this LaTeX rendering. Yeah. Um, Pillow is for um, working with images. So if you have a whole bunch of images and you want to convert them to black and white, or you want to create smaller thumbnails out of them, or you want to stitch them into a collage programmatically or something like that, um, pillow, sing for that. You can also use it in the notebook for like sort of showing, this is a quick example, you can actually embed things in the notebook without using pillow. But it's a, a demo of using pillow, but um, for example, if you wanted to rotate an image, you can do that with pillow. So kind of image transformations and things. Scikit image um, is like a, uh, a computer vision sort of library for Python. Um, so it can do things like find edges, for example, in an image, um, find contours and stuff. Um, so there's that. Bokeh is another visualization library, a plotting library, um, more for interactive web-based plots. It works in the notebook. Um, so you can, I, this might actually work in here. Yeah, so this is actually an interactive plot here. Um, and so there's an example of that. Um, you cannot, though, with Bokeh, save a PDF or something like that. I think it can output maybe PNGs or, some, or JPEGs or like one format. It's really for these interactive plots. When it comes to publication plots, you're really stuck with matplotlib or something like Seaborn that uses matplotlib under the hood. Um, Numba is something that you can use to speed, it's like a performance thing for Python. So in this example, this little decorator called JIT um, is wrapping this function, JIT comes from Numba, and then Numba is looking at this function and turning it into like a faster compiled version of this function so that it goes at uh, much faster speeds than doing the exact same thing in Python. Um, there are a lot of caveats about the kinds of data it can work with and the kinds of functions it can transform, but it can be useful sometimes for if you have some kind of algorithm that just doesn't support NumPy vectorization where you just have to write like a three layer nested loop or something, Numba might be helpful with that. Um, Cython is a way to write code that looks a lot like Python, but gets compiled to C. So again, this is another performance thing. Um, it kind of natively understands uh, NumPy arrays, so it's like it has good interoperability with NumPy arrays, just like Numba. Um, a lot of pandas is written in Cython so that it's faster. Um, but it's um, by the way, you can write C. You can write plain old C code and wrap it in in um, Python and then call it from Python, but. It has a lot of boilerplate, and people hate that boilerplate. 
so a lot of times when somebody needs to write something, they want it to run like C, they use Cython. And they write just their little bit of their program that they need to go fast in Cython. Um, <clears throat> one thing, neat thing about Cython is that you can use it, you can use the Cython magic, note the percent signs. You can do this in the notebook and write like a function that gets compiled by Cython right there in the notebook and then use it in the rest of your analysis. Um, I should note that like, so yesterday morning, there was a Cython tutorial down the hall. Um, so if any of this looks very interesting or you go back to the tutorials and you're like, hey, this stuff looks interesting, it's all gonna be on the web in, a couple of, in the next couple of days. Um, our friend back here is recording this one for the exact same reason. Um, so everything you see here or heard about here will end up on the web in a few days, so. That's true of a lot, almost all of the packages, right? There was a Bokeh yeah. tutorial, Cython, a... Scikit-learn, Scikit-image, a lot of these had tutorials going on. Um, thank you, friend, by the way. <laughs> um, and then, like, here's a little example showing how much faster, like, the Cython version of a Fibonacci calculator runs than the, the Python version. It's um, a couple orders of magnitude. And so GeoPandas is something if if uh, it wraps pandas to give you kind of some geographic tools too. Um, if you work with GIS data and you work maybe with PostGIS, um, GeoPandas would be something that would allow you to do a lot of the same um, GIS functionality from PostGIS in Python without having to stand up a whole SQL database instead. I don't know if any of you do GIS, but um, this kind of stuff allows you to test like whether to create like spatial paths like a region on the earth and then test whether two of these regions intersect or one is inside the other or something like this. Um, we do, because we work with geographic urban data at work, we do use PostGIS and we'll probably get into GeoPandas at some point. I don't know if any of you are astronomers. Osley is. <laughs> Um, there's a whole library for astronomers called AstroPy that has a just like, whether it's just reading data files or talking to online um, databases or doing cosmological calculations, AstroPy has stuff. Um, file formats, there you know, are a ton of these and you'll probably have to read them. We've seen that Pandas does a lot of them. Right, so good old pandas read underscore like 20 things, can read a lot of things, um, like CSV files. There's also built into Python a CSV module for reading and writing CSV files, if for some reason you don't want to involve pandas. Um, HDF5 is something you might run across. It's a binary file format. There are libraries called tables and H5Py for working with those. There's one for NetCDF, which you might run into if you, especially in Earth Sciences. Um, JSON is a common data format on the web. That's built into Python, and Pandas can work with JSON data too. Um, again, XML is used a lot on the web, um, or if you need to parse HTML, um, like I did when I got the precipitation data from the website, like they didn't have a CSV file. I had to scrape all of that data out of some horribly formatted HTML. I used LXML, um, this library. Um, and again, going back to GIS, there are some specialized GIS um, geographic data formats like GeoJSON, and there's a library called Fiona for working with those, and GeoPandas wrap, uses Fiona for reading that kind of data. Say you want to install some of this stuff. A good lot of that stuff comes with uh, Anaconda. So we saw that Seaborn doesn't. Numba might. I'm trying to, Numba's, I'm on the fence about that one, but Scikit Image and Scikit Learn do. Cython certainly does. Like almost all of those libraries I just mentioned come with Anaconda. If they don't, if you're using Anaconda, you can use something called conda to install packages. So there's, you can say conda search, um, for example, Seaborn, 
and it'll say, yes, I have some versions of Seaborn. And then you can say, conda install Seaborn. And it will go download it from the internet and install it. If you want to uninstall it later, you can use uninstall and say, conda uninstall Seaborn. And it will do that for you. Not, um, conda is a package manager made by the same people that make Anaconda. That's Continuum, a company called Continuum. And um, they also maintain like this archive of packages that you can install with Conda. But it's not everything. Not every Python package is available that way. For example, GeoPandas is not available that way. Um, so the other installer is called pip. Also comes with Anaconda. But pip has access to every package in, uh, on, on what's called the Python package index, which is a humongous, humongous trove of packages that just anybody can upload to. Um, and so, for example, if you wanted to install GeoPandas, you would go to the GeoPandas website, find out what the prerequisites were, make sure you had those installed, some of which can be installed by Conda, and then you would say pip install GeoPandas, and pip would install GeoPandas and install it for you. Um, and otherwise, it works a lot like Conda. It's, you can search, you can install, you can uninstall. Um, so that's installing things. If you're not using Anaconda, you won't have Conda. Or, or if you're not using something called Miniconda, you won't have access to Conda, and you will have to fall back on something like pip to do installations. And then there are even more manual ways to install things, too, that that you might get exposed to. So all right, that, that concludes our whirlwind tour of those things I just talked about. Um, any questions? Is, it, is there a, a parser um, type thing that, I mean, that allows you I, I don't know. Is there a name for that? Um, This is going to sound kind of snarky, but I think the answer is Python. Um, <clears throat> Python is fantastic at working with files and strings. And so if you've got some sort of custom data format that doesn't fit any kind of existing data format, you can use Python. You can open up the file as a text file in Python and then write your own readers for it, for sure. Um, that's like a core part of Python is like being able to work with files. That's, that's what a lot of people have done, but I, I was just wondering if it was. I, mean, I, I, could, I could figure that there's a, a, a lot of uh, people that want to parse out files that have parentheses and, 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 and have things grouped by parentheses and just have. And, and unless it's unless it's a, a standardized community data format, you're probably not going to find anything that can read it off the shelf. Well, but I would say something like I know Astrophy is reading, and I think NumPy is the same thing. Like you can denote what the delimiter is. You can denote what blank data looks like. Like there are all of these options that allow you to kind of custom describe what you have. If you have something that's really funky then I think what Matt's saying is true. Like, it's very easy in three lines to open a file and read in every line, and then and then you can manually clean your data. And maybe that's going to be a 10-line piece of code. But Python is very good at working with strings and reading files in that way. Yeah. <clears throat> Any of the, like, pandas' read table function, you can say, this is my delimiter. Um, these kinds of values are null data. Ignore those. These lines are comments and stuff. And you can you can parameterize it, but it is still expecting a delimited file. You know, so um, if 
this particular data format has a name and a community, I would search on Google to see whether anybody's already written something that has that. But if it's something you just invented that you use internally, you'll probably have to start from scratch to, to read that, if it has like some kind of hierarchy or something in it. Um, Um, but I, I've certainly written many of many a custom parser in Python, and it's it's fantastic for that. Um, any other questions? Was there another question? Well, I was just thinking of regular expressions too. Uh, regular expressions built into Python, absolutely. That can help. Yep. <laughs> um, been there, done that as well. Um, okay. Um, I did want to direct you to, uh, I forgot a minute to go, oops, not that button, to direct you to, for example, matplotlib.org. So all of these things I just talked about all have very extensive web pages. Um, if you go to matplotlib and look at their gallery, um, this is like a huge list of plots. So you can kind of go here and be like, I'm thinking about a plot like this. You can go through this and read it and find the one that looks like what you want and click on it and then go down here and here's the code. So you can kind of read about things this way. Um, I've often heard scikit-learns documentation lauded because in, in addition to teaching you how to um, use the library itself. It teaches you machine learning concepts too. So it can act, you can actually read the scikit-learn documentation and be like, does this technique apply to my situation sort of information. Um, and so Googling any of those libraries, and actually I, you'll, you notice I had probably had, I had the links I have links on every one of these pages to like the documentation, the homepage for each of these libraries. And um, docs.scipy.org is where you go for NumPy and SciPy documentation. Um, so matplotlab.org, pandas.pydata.org for pandas. Um, but searching will get you to any of this too with a search engine. Um, What's machine learning? <laughs> Um, machine learning is, uh, I, I feel like it covers a few things, um, but it's, it's a way of, uh, it's used a lot of times for classification, whereas in, uh, we have, or you might be used to modeling where you're doing regression, like fitting a linear model to some data to get a prediction of some other data, right? Um, <clears throat> that doesn't work very well with classification, though. Like, you want to know whether people are male or female, or you want to know whether they fall into some age range or what their occupation is. You know, some kind of classification, something that you can't feed through an equation. Um, machine learning helps, uh, I think, is designed mostly around that kind of thing. So, I mean, regression is a form of machine learning. You're taking some data and using it to train a model and then making predictions of other data. Um, but with other techniques, um, a lot of the techniques in what are called machine learning in scikit-learn, um, what you're trying instead to do is classify stuff into different, into different classes. Like, and so you give it some training data in the same way. It f does whatever it does to figure out how to make predictions, and then you feed it new data, and it predicts what class those, those new data fall into. Um, so it's like, you know, it's, it's kind of regression applied to classification a lot of the time. Though I, I, well, everything I just said should be taken with a grain of salt because I know next to nothing about machine learning. <coughs> um, I do want to show you the Software Carpentry website. Software-carpentry.org. Um, lessons, for example, hey, look at these familiar looking lessons about the shell and version control and programming with Python. Um, so that's kind of useful. Um, you can 
let's see a list of upcoming workshops. You can get the contact information. Whoops, that is not what I meant to do. Oh, that's the email. Um, so that, that's how you contact us. Um, which takes me to uh, kind of my next point is that uh, how many of you are interested in having a software carpentry workshop for your colleagues back at wherever you work or go to school? You guys might not be our typical audience. Usually we work with universities. But if you are, if you know somebody who is in need of a workshop like this, get in touch. We do this. We will travel. We don't just do this at conferences. Um, in fact, we mostly do this at universities um, and labs where people get in touch and say, hey, we could use some of this training at our workshop. We have some money to fly you out or uh, to fly some people out, or they can say, we don't have some money to fly. Actually, they almost always need money to fly you out um, because we're an all-volunteer organization, so we don't have a lot of money to throw around for stuff. But all you need to do is come up with the money to fly some people out, and we will try to find people local for you to keep that cost down. Um, and then we have an administrative fee that covers the cost of helping you find instructors and stuff. Um, but uh, we are totally game for going anywhere. We do these all over the world for all kinds of different people. Um, so totally recommend us to your colleagues if you know any, anyone who's interested. Um, everything of ours is online. Like, um, like I just showed you the, the uh, lessons page there. Everything we did today um, is online in that GitHub repo and Jens's repo from yesterday. Those aren't going anywhere. Those will be around in perpetuity. The Etherpad will be around for as long as Mozilla leaves that thing online. Um, and the, the GitHub stuff will be up until GitHub disappears, um, which will probably be a while. So none of that's going anywhere. Feel free to take advantage of it, reuse it, share it. Um, if you are feeling really brave and wanted to teach any of our lessons to your colleagues yourselves, go for it. That's totally fine. Um, you can use our materials. You can use our repos. No problem. Um, if you're interested in being an instructor after this, you can do that, too. Again, same contact address. Get in touch and say you're interested in becoming an instructor. You go through a training program um, teaching you some pedagogical skills. And uh, then you can join the ranks. And uh, so Elizabeth is, went through a, a training program we did back in January. This is her first workshop, um, getting to see how we run everything. And uh, now she's probably feeling ready to teach one on her own. Oh, totally. <laughs> um, but we're, we're, an all, we're an all volunteer workforce. And so we're always looking for more volunteers. Um, and uh, we would be pleased to have you. We do want to do good, bad. Um, remember yesterday, I had you write something good about the day on your green sticky note, and something you didn't like about the day on your red sticky note, and leave those at your seat. And we'll pick them up afterward. Any, any questions? Um, if you want to, like, I'm going to, um, I need to find the groups that group. So the the SciPy organizers set up a Google group for us. Um, and I'm going to paste this into the Etherpad. If you are not already signed up for this group, um, it would be great if you signed up because uh, we'll be sending out like a, a questionnaire. Um, afterwards, that will, well, it will question you about um, the workshop, whether you liked it, whether you found it useful, things you would like different, things you like that you would like to stay the same, et cetera. Um, and I'm pretty sure that's anonymous. And um, we, it's useful for us for things like talking to, to funding organizations and stuff, because we apply for grants and things. So the, the feedback is useful. Um, and then we also want to know 
what we can change, how we can get better. Um, and uh, we, you may also, if I, if I have your email address, which we may, we may get your email address somehow too, because um, we do some kind of like longitudinal evaluation too, get back in touch in like six months and see if you're still using anything. Um, this, the uh, assessments of how you all are doing in the future is really important to us because we need to know whether you actually ended up using everything, anything you learned about in the last two days and why you ended up using those things and how we helped. Um, as a lot of you probably know, funders ask a lot of questions. Um, okay, Osley, am I forgetting anything? All right. It has been lovely hanging out with you all. Um, what's that? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we'll hang out for a few minutes. Um, if you're curious what's going on, and thought the host of the conference has like a an open an open get together at their office in downtown Austin tonight. Um, you can look that up on the conference website. I think from like six to nine or something, they'll have food and drinks. Um, if you want to hang out with some of those people, and then. Uh, Good news, the conference starts an hour later tomorrow, so you don't have to get up quite so early. <clears throat> Things get started at 9 o'clock. Um, the talk schedule here. Yep, 9 o'clock in the grand ballroom upstairs. I'll have a keynote. Um, I'm totally, like, if you see me around the conference the rest of the week, totally happy to talk about anything. Um, if you have questions, I'll be doing office hours every afternoon from 3 to 3.30, kind of during the afternoon break in room 210 in the hallway upstairs. Um, hopefully some other people will join me too, like Osley uh, maybe, and anyone else I can recruit. So if you have questions, you want help installing something, um, feel free to swing by that as well. Um, we're here to help. Thank you for coming. Thank you.